Hey everyone, hi, our Pastor Joseph here, Karibu Sana, and sorry for starting a bit late today. I had uh, some new gadgets, uh, but I was just trying to reconfigure and configure so that we can just, uh, so that I can actually begin in quite a while. Uh, the way I had planned it to turn out, it hasn't turned out that way, but we thank God for technology and we thank God for our uh, for the privilege and honor to just come and getting to teach the word of God and getting to share scripture. And today we'll be looking at the dimensions of spiritual warfare. We'll be looking at the dimensions of spiritual warfare. And uh, the, the, the teaching today is based on uh, several books within the reality series. And the first particular uh, the first particular dimension of spiritual warfare that I'll be talking about is something that I've highlighted uh, in two of my books. And the first book that I've highlighted it uh, is in the Metaverse, the Metaphysical Nature of Life. And the second book that I've highlighted it actually... Uh, in three books, you find that I've really dealt with this particular issue that I'm going to mention later on. And in the second book that I mentioned, it, uh, it has to do with uh, the reality of music, which I'm also giving for free. So if you're interested, just uh, drop me uh, drop me a message on my inbox and I'll just send you the book. I'm giving out a free PDF copy on the reality of music, uh, which talks about how the enemy uses music and, what's it, uh, and the power of the potency that is inherent in music so we get to look at that as well and the other thing is that i also get to handle that particular topic when i'm talking about uh excuse me in the uh in book six of the reality series that's titled uh humanity and probability uh no in book six of the reality series that is titled humanity and in book five which uh, is also titled uh, book five is titled reality and probability and i also get to talk about this a little bit so i'm just teaching this particular topic and this topic is scattered within uh the reality series and presently you're working on uh, probably it's going to be either book nine or book ten uh, within the reality series and We'll be talking about consciousness we'll be talking about consciousness what exactly is consciousness and we'll be looking at understanding as well as we are thinking about it and as we are talking about it uh, do we understand because we are conscious or are we conscious because we understand you know uh, the, this is a particular thing uh, that i get to look at in the book as led by the spirit of god and we get to go deep into what consciousness is all about we get to examine it you get to examine how um how we exist in God and how our existence in God affects our consciousness and we also get to look at uh, the construction of the consciousness and the structure of the consciousness at what particular point when God created man did man actually become conscious and did man understand uh, at what particular time that man actually became conscious and we get to look at what exactly is consciousness we get to examine that we get to go deep into that and we also get to look at God's consciousness we also get to see uh, what exactly do you mean when we say that God is omniscient and how does that apply to the consciousness of God? How does that apply to the being of God, to the person of God? And also we look at the human consciousness and we get to examine uh, is the human consciousness in the brain, is the human consciousness in the soul or is the human consciousness in the spirit? So we get to look at these particular topics and we get to examine and see where exactly consciousness has proceeded from and we get to uh, also get a little bit deeper into that and we look at cognitive structures and we see how consciousness uh, get to even see how each and every single one of us we exist within the same uh, realm we exist in the physical realm but our our experiences and uh, our consciousness they are very much different it's the same consciousness yeah but we have different experiences within uh, the human experience and these different experiences within the human experience uh, they they um, they structure our they structure our cognitive in a certain particular way and that means that the things that we are conscious of the things that we are conscious of as individuals uh, tend to vary. The things that we are conscious of as individuals tend to vary. And our experiences uh, determine uh, our experiences determine our perspective. So we also get to look at that. We get to see, uh, we get to actually merge that with existence in God because the Bible says we are in Christ. We are in Christ. So being in Christ, what does that what does that really mean in terms of the con of the human conscious? And we also get to look at what does the Bible mean when it says that we have the mind of Christ. So what exactly does that mean? We have the mind of Christ. We also get to look at that uh, in the new book that's coming out pretty soon that's titled Consciousness. We also get to look at that, we get to examine it, and we get to see how God structured humanity. And as I said before, we get to answer one particular question. Uh, is the human consciousness in the brain, is the human consciousness in the soul, or is the human consciousness in the spirit? So we get to look at that and get to see if it is... 
in one of these so how does how how, how does that uh, what are the ramifications of that in terms of if perhaps it's in the soul what are the ramifications of that to the spirit what are the, the ramifications of that to the brain so we also get to examine that and we get deep a little bit into that and the reason why I'm mentioning these are this book that's titled consciousness it's because of what we'll be looking at today in terms of the dimensions of spiritual warfare the dimensions of spiritual warfare and if you have your Bibles uh, you can just turn to the book of to the book of Job chapter 1. We'll be looking at the book of Job chapter 1. That will be where we'll actually be teaching from today. And before we get there, uh, let's just bow down for a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you and give you glory for today. Father, we say that you are worthy and holy because indeed you are. Almighty God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the Prince of Peace. You are holy and righteous, Abba Father. Shando braga zade ba shata brako to zede begin de brada zade ba kanda barede ba shanda roko to zodo zede be de gede baganda brago do zede be ma kanda brige de be gede baganda braga da baganda braga da baganda braga da baganda baganda baga shete be gede ba oh zande breke sheke te be geri bo zudu bro 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 rika ta kaji kato koso koto kondiri gidi baganda rado zede be de ganda garaga Garaganda, 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 Basha, Tabagande, Breshe, Tebe, Bebe. Father, I just begin to speak against worry and fear. And I speak your peace. I speak your shalom to everyone listening. Oh, God. I speak shalom, 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 your peace that surpasses all understanding. That they will be anxious about nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, they will make Jehovah God their request known to you. And the peace that surpasses all understanding, Jehovah God will be their portion in the name of Jesus. Father, even begin to pray now that you open our understanding. Enlighten us. Let us understand these things of, of your word, these realities that are contained within your word, Abba Father. Let us see into the deeps of scripture. Let us see the realities hidden in scripture. Enlighten our eyes so that we can see the hidden things in your law, Abba Father. Reba shanda bagande ba zedebe rokoto zedeba ganda besheteke reba goto zetebe gedebe gedebe rasho to ganda bagada bagada bagande reshete baganda ah she brokoto bobobo Oh, shede be ge de ge ze ge de baka raba sweet Jesus, hallelujah. Radogo de bagande baganda baganda rabo shete be ge de ganda. Zede be de be de bosh. Kata kata kata. Mande broko tobo zede be ge de baganda. Rasho to godo godo ze re be ge de be ge de ba. May this word take root in our hearts and bear fruit upwards, Jehovah. We thank you, almighty God. We, we, we glorify your name, Abba Father. We glorify your holy name, Jehovah God, in the name of Jesus. Shabra gada baganda badi gede 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 zobrodo zede bagara baganda bragada baganda shate bede gede baka. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Have your way, Spirit of the Living God. Have your way, Abba Father. Speak through me. May I teach your word, O oh God? May I speak your oracles the way you have intended, the way you have purposed. That Jehovah God, we might comprehend and understand you. That we might be integrated into your reality, Abba Father. That we might look at things from a trichotomous perspective and not a dichotomous perspective. That we look at things from the reality of being above the sun and not under the sun, Almighty God. For your word says we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That means we are seated above the sun, Almighty God. That our existence is above the sun, that we look at reality from a higher plane of existence, which is you, Almighty Father. So, Lord, have your way. Have your way. God, calm the nerves. Calm the nerves, Almighty God. Calm the nerves of your people, Jehovah. Holy Spirit, have your way. Even those that are struggling, doubting you, Jehovah God, I just begin to pray. And decree and declare, Jehovah God, that their faith, their faith is getting a resurgence, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus. Where they need, where they need you to reveal yourself, Jehovah. Reveal yourself, O oh God. Let them pursue your being, not your hand. Some are doubting you, Jehovah God, because there are things they have waited on and you've not yet done them, Jehovah God. It's not yet the fullness of time, Lord, but I pray 
that their worship will be anchored on your being, Jehovah God, on your person, that their relationship with you will be based on your being and on your person, Jehovah God. Knowing your being and your person, Jehovah God. Not just focusing on the expressions of God, but on the being of God. So Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Shabragada Bagandi Zidibe, Rakoto Zidi Baganda Bagada Bagada Bashiti Begidim. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, just uh, turn with me to the book of Job. Turn with me to the book of Job. And uh, when you come and we're going to look at the book of Job, there are a couple of things that we are going to look at. And one of the things we are going to look at uh, is I'll just mention a couple of scriptures because uh, if I go on and I have to read all of them, if I read all of them, we'll not get into the teaching as much as we ought to. And I actually don't think I'm going to exhaust uh, this particular teaching to the fullest. We might probably have to do it in series or uh, we might probably have to do it in series dealing with certain particular topics and so forth uh, or other certain particular dimensions and aspects of spiritual warfare. But the first thing that we are going to look at is the relationship between God and Job. And what we get to realize is that Satan actually came. When you read the book of Job chapter 1, Satan actually came and asked and asked God uh, if he could have that particular permission to tempt Job or if he could have that particular permission to actually attack Job. And when he's attacking Job, there are a couple of things that you get to see from scripture when it comes to the attack that is propelled to the person of Job. And when we get to see this, and we get to read this later on, when we get to see this, we get to see the operations of the enemy. But when God is telling, when God is giving certain that leeway to actually attack Job, there, there is a statement that God makes and God says the following, that behold, when you read the New King James Version, it says God told him the following, behold, he is in your power or he is at your power, but do not touch his person, do not touch his person, but he is in your power. And the first thing we get to see is that there are a couple of catastrophes that follow. And among those particular catastrophes, the first one that I'd like to begin, according to the order of the teaching, is the following. The first thing that one of the attacks that the enemy, uh, one of the ways through which the enemy attacks the body of Christ and attacks Christians, and not only Christians, but also attacks men in general, is the following. There is something known as uh, cognitive attacks. We have cognitive attacks. And cognitive attacks are centered, just as the word says, cognitive attacks, they are centered on the mind. So they are mental assaults by the enemy. And the aim of these mental attacks is the following, to cause us to agree with a particular reality that is is being projected to us by the enemy either through people or either through the things we watch and the things that we listen to that has to do with music that has to do with movies in other words that has to do with the dimension of entertainment within the physical realm but when you look at the book of job the one of the one of one of the cognitive attacks that job faced came from the wife one of the cognitive attacks came from the wife and the wife told job the following you're still holding on to your integrity why don't you cast god and die why don't you cast god and die and after that job tells the wife the following you're speaking as one of the foolish women you're speaking as if you do not know god you're speaking as if you do not know god and the reason why he says that and you go and you read a little bit you find that the focus of job was the focus of job was god the focus of job was god but one statement that is made in scripture is the following that in all these things job did not sin with his mouth job did not sin with his mouth now, the reason why the Bible says Job did not sin with his mouth is because we speak from the abundance of the heart. We speak from the abundance of the heart. That means we speak from the construct. We speak from our cognitive constructs. We speak from our cognitive constructs. And whatever we agree with, it becomes part and parcel of our cognitive, uh, of our cognitive, co cognitive structure. And the moment it is part and parcel of our cognitive structure, we begin to speak it. We begin to speak it and we begin to declare it. So Job did not declare these particular things, which means the following. Job did not curse God. And because Job did not curse God, that tells us that Job resisted the cognitive attacks from the enemy. He resisted the cognitive attacks from the enemy. He resisted, I again repeat, he resisted the cognitive attacks from the enemy. And in order for us to resist the cognitive attacks from the enemy, we must have something that is known as mental fortitude. We must have mental fortitude, mental strength. We must have mental strength. And mental fortitude is the ability to resist 
conformity. It is the ability to resist conformity. Because whenever the enemy is attacking us, cognitively speaking, he's attacking us so that we can agree with certain realities that he's projecting through people or certain realities that he's projecting himself directly to us and not using the channel of a person or not using the channel of a uh, the channel of, 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 of entertainment in, in terms of the television or in terms of music, in terms of radio and so forth. He uses these particular tools through the Babylonian frequency to actually attack Christians cognitively speaking and also to attack man cognitively speaking now the one of the one of the things that uh, happens during these cognitive attacks is that when these cognitive attacks are actually persistent because the devil will persist the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you resist you only resist that which persists so he he's a person that persists He's a person that will persist and will persist. He does not give up that particular easily. And uh, he does not give up easily. And for that reason, we need to have, we need to have um, mental fortitude. We need to have mental fortitude. We need to be strong mentally speaking. We need to, uh, to develop mental fortitude to the point that we know, and we also need to have discernment to the point that we know when a thought that is being projected to us is not of us. We also need to discern. We also need to, dis to, to discern when Satan is speaking through other people as well. Because when you look at the story, when you look at the Bible, and you look at the story of Christ, at the reality of the person of Christ when Christ was existing in the physical realm, one of the things that happens is that uh, Christ says he's going to die. Then immediately after he says that, Peter pulls him aside and Peter is like, hey, don't say that. The Bible actually says that uh, Peter rebuked Christ. Peter rebuked Christ and rebuked Christ very, very strongly. Like, don't even say that. Don't even say that. You know, like, repent for saying that. You know, like, take it back. Don't say that. And Jesus said something very interesting. Jesus said the following, get thee behind me, Satan. Was it that Christ was calling Peter Satan? No. Christ was speaking to Satan who had projected that particular thought in the person of Peter and Peter had actually spoken. So that was a direct projection of Satan through Peter. And we need to understand that most of the time Satan will use the people within our spheres to project certain particular thoughts to us, to project certain particular thoughts to us. And it is for this reason that we need to, we need to, be, to be very careful when we are telling people our plans. Not everybody needs to know your plan. Not everybody needs to know your plan. Not everybody needs to know what you're planning. Because sometimes we inform the enemy when we're informing people. Let me repeat that. Sometimes we inform the enemy when we're informing people. We inform the enemy when we're informing people. We need to know that Satan is not all-knowing. He's not all-knowing. That means he doesn't know everything. And there are certain particular realities uh, within our... There are certain particular realities within our spheres of existence, within the physical realm, that he's not aware of. But the moment we, uh, we continue speaking and talking and talking and talking about it, the moment we continue doing that, we are actually informing the enemy the moment we are informing other people. Not every person needs to know what you're planning. Not every person needs to know your next step. It is very significant. Excuse me, it is very significant and important for us to keep our mouth shut. We need to learn how to keep our mouth shut. We need to learn how to keep our mouth shut. There are people we ought to tell. There are people we ought not to tell. And there are people that need, that the moment they get to know about what you're planning is when the plan has actually come into fruition. It is when the plan has come into fruition. For many people, many believers and many people, one of the things that happens is that their plans and their project are killed in the seed stage because of talking a lot because of talking a lot because they meet so and so they just say oh i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm doing that you know it's very significant for us to understand not everybody needs to know what you're planning and that is why we need self-control because self-control has a lot to do with also managing your mouth it has a lot to do with managing your mouth it has a lot to do with uh, what you say and what you don't say and the bible says there's a time for everything so there's a time to reveal a plan and there's a time where this particular plan ought not to be revealed and even when we say and we are talking and we are telling people things we need to know that not everything can be told and even that which is told it is told to a particular people and at a particular time so in terms of that we need to be careful of our counsel we need to be careful of our counsel why there are people we tell that you know what i'm planning to do this and i'm planning to do that and the moment we tell them i'm planning to do this and i'm planning to do that other than just informing the enemy what happens is the following and i'm not saying that they are the enemy but we have monitoring spirits and when you have monitoring spirits uh they they just 
followers and in following in, in following us and in following other people sometimes what happens is the following they, they just take notes you know they take notes okay so this and this is happening this and this is happening that's why the bible says in the book of ecclesiastes somewhere in chapter in ecclesiastes chapter 10 but do not that do not speak ill of the king because a bird of the air will carry your voice a bird of the air will carry your voice now when he's talking about a bird of the air carrying your voice he's talking about monitoring spirits and the fact that sometimes when you're speaking to people we are actually informing the enemy and these monitoring spirits go and report hey you know what this and this is happening so and so is planning this and is planning that and also that's why we need to be careful in terms of speaking because sometimes we'll tell someone i'm planning a b c d but their response will discourage us their response will discourage us so it's very significant for us to know who to tell it's very significant for us to know who to tell because there are people we tell things and the moment we tell them these things we are actually introducing uh cognitive battles to ourselves we're actually introducing co cognitive battles we become the setup we become the setup for battles against us cognitively speaking that that's why it's important for us to have people that we trust to have people that we can talk to people that can encourage us people that can build us up people that can pray with you people that will tell you the truth yes and people that will understand where you are actually coming from it's very significant for us to have a people that also have our revelation because sometimes we have people people in our lives but the people in our lives do not have our revelations and most of the friends that sometimes are existing within our spheres they are people that do not have our revelations and when somebody does not have your revelation when somebody does not know your purpose when somebody does not know your destiny the reason why God has put you on earth even when you're pursuing it they can end up discouraging you because they don't understand and know where you're heading to they don't understand and know where you're heading to and there is what we also need to know is that there's particular people in our lives there is how they see us and there is how we've been called to be by God but there is the expectation of people based on how they want us to be there's the expectation of people on how they want us to be and because of that you find that their people will be telling I'm planning this I'm planning that I'm planning this but their expectation of us their expectation of us which is not uh, which is not coherent and is not reflective of our existence and the realities that God has put in us and the person that God has called us to become because of their expectation which uh, they, they, they begin to attack us cognitively speaking for them they think that they are doing something good that they are encouraging us that they're directing us to the right course but when they do not have our revelations and when they do not know what God has spoken in our lives and when they do not know where you're heading to in terms of vision in terms of destiny they can become a channel they can become a channel through which we get to actually experience cognitive attacks they can become a channel through which we get to experience cognitive attacks it is for this reason also that it is important for us to have the revelation of people around us because the moment you have the revelation of a person around you it becomes very easy for you to encourage them it becomes very easy for you to encourage them it is for this reason that a lot of young leaders and a lot of ministers have given up early have given up early in terms of serving God they've given up and they've walked away why because of cognitive battles why because you find that the people where they serve and the people that they serve they have an expectation of them but that expectation that they have of them is not God's will for them that is not what God has called them to become and when people are speaking about them when people are speaking in their life they speak in their life and they speak about them based on their own expectation but not based on what god has appointed for them so it's very significant for us also in terms of uh, when we face cognitive battles when people speak they say this and they say that we need to we, we, we actually need to see what we listen to we need to see what we listen to we need we need to have uh, what we need to do is the following we need to see everything through vision we need to see everything through vision why because somebody will say ABCD somebody will say this and this and when they say that and that they're speaking from their expectation they're speaking from that which they desire for you but what they desire for you is not necessarily what God has appointed for you it is not necessarily what God has appointed for you so as you listen to them run back on your knees and pray run back on your knees and pray and ask God God I've had ABCD somebody has advised me to do this and to do that does this is this your will is this your will then when God tells you no 
You let it go and you do what God has directed you to do. Because at the end of the day, the ministry that God has put in you or the vision that God has put in you and the destiny that God has put in you, in ter- especially in terms of ministry, it is not your ministry. It's God's ministry entrusted to you. It's God's ministry entrusted to you. So at the end of the day, you are the one that is going to be accountable for that particular ministry that God has put in you, for what God has instilled in you. And we get to see that in the parable of the talents. We will give an account for what God has put in us. So it's very significant for us. The moment we are told this and we are told that, let us see it through vision. Let us ask ourselves, is this in agreement with where God is leading me? If it is not in agreement with where God is leading you, you listen And after listening, you do what God has told you to do. Listen, but do what God has told you to do. And it's for that particular reason that you find sometimes uh, in in the church, especially or even just within the setup of friends, especially if there's no that particular understanding that, you know what, this is the direction I'm heading to. When there's not that particular understanding, what happens is people begin to speak ill of each other. Because what they expected of them is not what God has called them to do. And you find that there is that particular conflict between the reality of God pertaining to a person and the expectation of a person pertaining to that particular person. And this happens especially uh, in, in, especially when it comes to young people and especially also when it comes to parents. Parents have an expectation of what their child ought to be, but God has God has ordained what they ought to be and it's upon the parent to discern what God has called this particular child to be and you find that most of the time when the parent does lacks that particular understanding then the parent becomes a channel through which the child faces a lot of cognitive attacks and a lot of cognitive battles a lot of cognitive attacks and a lot of cognitive battles and one of one of the cognitive battles that we face also has a lot to do with comparing It has a lot to do with comparing. And the enemy knows this. That's why sometimes the enemy will have us compare ourselves with so-and-so. And And the moment you begin to compare yourself with so-and-so, and and you begin to conform your reality and your person to that person you're comparing yourself with, you end up rejecting your reality. And when you end up rejecting your reality, what follows is the following, that you begin to reconstitute. You begin to reconstitute your microcosmic realities. And you begin to want to be like this other person. And the moment you begin to want to be like this other person you begin to lose yourself and you actually end up rejecting yourself there is such a thing as self-rejection and self-rejection most of the time is as a result of cognitive battles self-rejection most of the time is as a result of cognitive battles and it has a lot to do with comparison at other times it has a lot to do with experience sometimes we probably have, especially young people have been in relationships with people they've treated us bad they've abused us and by that the enemy begins to manipulate the enemy begins to manipulate our minds by telling us you know you're not good enough so and so as uh, so and so did this to you and now it has reoccurred again you see you're not that good enough you're not good enough for so and so nobody will ever love you because two people or three people have rejected you we need to understand that the enemy likes manipulating experiences to his own end. He likes manipulating experiences to his own end. And he uses the experiences we've actually undergone to uh, to attack us cognitively speaking. He turns an experience he turns an experience into a cognitive battle by consistently repeating it, repeating it and whispering it on our minds, uh, in our minds like you know what, hey so and so did this to you and now again so and so has done this to you and as a result we begin defining ourselves with our experience and one of the best ways of winning that winning that particular battle is exhorting the lesson above the experience because in every experience there is a lesson and the moment we miss the lesson it becomes very easy for us to lose a cognitive battle that is uh, that is uh, that has actually proceeded out of that has actually proceeded out of an experience that we have encountered or of experiences that you have encountered that you have actually encountered so we need to understand that and we need to move past that by realizing our experiences do not define us that even the words of people especially when people begin to speak ill of us because we do not meet excuse me because we do not meet their expectations even in a church setup it can happen it can happen when uh, you are even probably under an authority and you do not meet the expectations of the authority but sometimes you'll not be meeting the expectation of the authority but you'll be meeting the expectation of god and you'll be fulfilling god's will sometimes there is that particular conflict between god's will and people's will 
And when there is that particular conflict between God's will and people's will, what happens is the moment you begin to fulfill God's will and you begin to operate in God's will, that, that there is that battles. Those battles begin to happen. Cognitive attacks begin to come when we are not conforming to the expectation of people, but we are conforming to the expectation of God. So that has a lot to do with cognitive battles. And the moment we begin to agree and the moment we begin to conform to certain uh, cognitive battles and we begin to agree with thoughts that the enemy is projecting, either through the media or uh, either through, through the media or either through conversations, and that's why we also need to be very careful with conversations as well, because the conversations you get into, the conversations you get into need a lot of discernment because conversations are constructions that construct realities. Conversations are constructions that construct realities in us and eventually having constructed realities in us, conversations will end up constructing real our conversations will end up determining the realities that we construct from ourselves. They, they'll end up affecting that which we do. They'll end up determining that which we construct, uh, eventually speaking. So we need to also be careful with conversations. You do not need to always speak in every conversation. You don't need to always speak in every conversation. And also, you don't need to uh, listen to every particular conversation. Because there are certain conversations you listen, and the moment you listen to a certain particular conversation, and the moment you participate in a certain particular conversation, what you have overheard becomes, what you have overheard actually becomes a tool for the enemy. And the enemy begins to use what you have overheard to attack you. He begins to use it uh, to cause you to uh, begin to change your perspective on certain particular people. And that has a lot to do with gossip. Because gossip is something that the enemy uses uh, to project thoughts it, co it it actually comes paired with it comes paired with these cognitive attacks that i'm talking about these mental attacks that i'm talking about thought projections because the enemy projects his thoughts through, pe uh, through people he can also project thoughts by himself and he can also project thoughts uh, through the media uh, what we watch and what we listen to he can also do that so the moment we are hanging around with people that gossip and the moment that you're engaging in certain particular conversations, there are certain particular thoughts that the enemy projects through these particular people. That's why it's significant that when we are listening to people, don't you don't always have to respond. And I repeat, you don't always have to respond. You don't always have to have a feedback. Because sometimes, because you want to have a feedback, when you give a feedback, you can actually be agreeing with a certain particular thought. And when you agree with that particular thought, you end up sinning with your mouth. You end up agreeing with something that you, that you should not have agreed with in the first place. Or at other particular times, what we need to do is the moment we've listened, we listen. And after listening, we need to also have a lot of discernment because we listen to people. They've said this and they've said that. Now, having said what they have said and they have expressed their opinion about a particular person, uh, when they have expressed their opinion about a particular person we need to respect their opinion that is their opinion that is their opinion most of the time when we get into certain particular conversations or certain particular um when, when we actually agree with certain particular thoughts about certain particular people uh, what happens is the following if god was speaking to us about this particular person and we end up agreeing with the lies or with the gossip about these particular people and we begin losing god's perspective about this particular person uh, maybe perhaps let's give them a name uh, maybe brian we begin losing god's perspective about brian because of what is being said about Brad. At the end of the day, what happens is that we are, and God was speaking to us about Brad. We end up losing the revelation of Brad. We end up losing the revelation of Brad. And revelation ceases. God stops talking to us about Brad. Why? Because we have believed a lie, and yet God has revealed the truth to us about this particular person that is Brad. So, we need to be very careful. The conversations you get into, you do not, and I repeat, we don't have to always have feedback. We don't always have to uh, engage in every particular conversation. Sometimes it's best to just sit and listen. To sit and listen, that's it, to sit and listen. And at other times, it is best not to sit and listen, but it is best to walk away. It is best to walk away, to find a way to walk away. Because at the end of the day, when you begin tolerating gossip, gossip ends up being constructed in you as a reality. It ends up being constructed in you as a reality. And the enemy begins now to use you. The enemy begins to use you to project thoughts in other particular people. Also, one of the ways through which the enemy uh, uh, projects certain particular thoughts through people is, because, is, is, is through the following way. People know your history. 
There are people that know your history. There are people that know what you have gone through. There are people that know what you have experienced. There are people that know your bad choices and, and the mistakes that you have made and so forth. And when you're beginning to progress in your life and you're beginning to see past the mistakes that you've made and you're beginning to move past your past too fast, too furious, and you're heading to the direction that God has appointed for you, one of the things the enemy will do, the enemy will bring up your past. The enemy will bring up your past. There are people that regardless of how much you progress, regardless of how much you change, regardless of how much um, God uses you, they will still be holding on to your past and they will still be talking about the mistakes you've made and they will be exalting the mistakes you've made above every good thing that you've done and above every good thing that God has done in your life and God has done through you. So we need to also know that sometimes the enemy will use your past. The enemy will have people talk about your past. The enemy will have people talk about what you did. The enemy will have people talk about, oh, you dated so and so, you dated so and so, you dated so and so. You know, your past, the enemy will use your past because there are certain particular histories within our history that the enemy knows. And he uses these particular histories to cause us to go back to the past or to cause us to to cause us actually to give up and see you know what there's no point there's no point if if i've changed this much if god has changed me this much and people are still talking about my past then what is the point what is the point and you have to know the devil will always be talking about your history the devil will always be talking about your history but you are not your past you are not your past you are not your past your past does not define you your past that does not define you. Your mistakes do not define you. Let me repeat. Your mistakes do not define you. Yes, you have learned. You have learned from your past. Pick up the lessons from your past. Let the lessons that you have learned from your mistakes restructure your, your, restructure your cognitive structure. And let them also restructure your person and your being. And move forward from that. And when people talk about it, don't let that bother. Focus on where you're going. Focus on where you're going. Why? Because the enemy, when the enemy sees you're heading somewhere, he's going to actually use Christians. Sometimes he uses Christians. Sometimes he uses people that are not Christians to resurrect your dead past. To resurrect your dead past. What I call as the miracles of the flesh. It begins to resurrect your dead past. These are miracles of the flesh. They begin to raise your dead past. To raise your dead past. And they raise your dead past so that they can take you back to the past. So that they can take you back to the past. But the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the Bible tells us that in Christ Jesus we are saved. We are being saved and we shall be saved. So in your becoming process in the person of Christ, there are mistakes that you will make. But those mistakes that you have made, they do not define you. You are not your mistakes. And if you learn from your mistakes and you pick up the lessons and you hold on to the lessons, they will help you to fulfill the destiny that God has for you. They will help you to fulfill the destiny that God has for you. God does not waste our mistakes. God does not waste our does not waste our mistakes. He wants us to learn from our mistakes. And the moment we learn from our mistakes, we become better. Why? Because in every mistake there is a retake. So you need to discern your retake and the retake in the mistake is the lesson. You need to learn and the moment you learn, you move forward. You move forward. And one of the other ways through which the enemy attacks us, cognitively speaking, these cognitive attacks is by orchestrate, is by designing situations and circumstances. Designing situations and circumstances. And what happens is the following. God can actually deliver you from a past. God can deliver you from a past. And having delivered you from a past, let's say perhaps it's a past where you used to drink. Or it's a past where, um, you know, in terms of you used to live in sexual immorality or something of the sort. Uh, God can deliver you from that particular past. But because the devil knows about your past, he can orchestrate certain particular situations within your existence where the people that come your way or the people that you work with or the people that are, or the people that approach you in terms of a relationship, they're actually people that used to live, uh, they're actually people that live the past life that you used to live. And if we are not careful, sometimes uh, we, we, ca we can actually think that our reality has not changed because we have, we have new people 
that reflects the old lifestyle that we used to live and they have come and they have approached us and they're talking to us and we can tend to think that we've not changed or we can tend to think that we are in a particular cycle we can tend to think that we're in a particular cycle because we are in the same situations that we used to be in the past where people of a particular nature or of a particular character maybe perhaps sexual immorality are coming towards us and they want to actually actualize that particular reality of sexual immorality by approaching us and what we need to know is the following that satan can orchestrate circumstances and situations by manipulating people and programming them into your life and bring them into your life so that you can think that you still exist within the same uh, within the same environment that you used to exist in in the past and we need to know that when that has happened we need to know that he has just manipulated a circumstance he has manipulated a circumstance and when he manipulates a circumstance he manipulates a circumstance uh, so that he can actually get to you so that he can actually get to you because when you look at the wife of job and the wife of job coming and telling job you know what cast god and die just cast god and die that was a projection from the enemy that was a projection from the enemy that was a direct projection from the enemy that was a thought that was being projected through the wife of job from satan so you find that this particular circumstance and situation and setup where the wife of job told job the following cast god and die was actually a circumstantial manipulation it was a setup by the enemy and most of the time the enemy will set us up the enemy will set us up when you look at when you look at the story of joseph in scripture in the book of genesis uh, the enemy actually set up joseph the enemy set up joseph using potiphar's Potiphar wife that was a circumstantial that was circumstantial manipulation and the circumstantial manipulation was centered at bringing joseph down it was an attack on his destiny it wasn't it was an attack on his destiny but it was also a cognitive it was also a cognitive cognitive attack it was a cognitive assault why because potiphar's wife approached joseph not once not twice not thrice she was very persistent now that particular persistence was a cognitive attack even when you come and you look at uh, when you come and you look at the story of when you look at the story of samson in the book of judges from judges chapter i believe chapter 15 onwards uh, and you look at delilah and samson and you find that delilah insisted so much you know what ah samson just tell me tell me what is the secret what is the secret she insisted and she persisted now that was a cognitive attack that was a cognitive attack and when Samson gave in to that particular attack what happened he lost his strength and not only lost his strength the Spirit of God left him and he did not know that the Spirit of God had left him and also you find that he lost his vision he lost his vision so most of the time when we give in to cognitive attacks cognitive attacks are centered at causing you to lose vision they are centered at causing you to lose vision they are also centered at accessing your soul they are centered at, at accessing your understanding they are centered at, at accessing your imagination and the moment your imagination is captured there is a dream manipulation the moment your understanding is captured there is the manipulation of your thought process and when there is a manipulation of your thought process there is a manipulation of the reality that you author and the reality that you actualize and also where there is an access into your understanding there's an access into your understanding there is a manipulation of your cognitive structure there is a manipulation of your cognitive structure so when the enemy has access into our understanding uh, the moment we agree with certain particular thoughts whether it's thoughts of fear our uh, thoughts of doubt thoughts that we are not good enough and so forth you know our uh, thoughts of you know what I'm just gonna give up uh, like for instance thoughts that uh, like the thought that was projected through the wife of job when certain particular when we agree with certain particular thoughts the enemy has access into our understanding and the reason why he has access into our understanding is so that he can actually now he can reconstruct our mental structure or our cognitive structure to be in his image and in his likeness and the moment he has access to that that particular manipulation begins to happen and when it begins to happen and remember our thought patterns form our habits our thought patterns form our habits so we begin to act a certain particular way we begin to act a certain particular way in conformity to the spirit 
behind, in conformity to the spirit behind the thought that we have agreed with, in conformity to the spirit behind the thought that we have agreed with. And at the end of the day, what that happens is the following, that uh, when that happens, there is uh, the enemy begins now to generate certain particular inclinations or propensities in us. And when he generates these particular propensities and inclinations in us, what happens is, what happens after that is the following, that our microcosmic realities of the souls, the powers of the souls, they are actually reconfigured and reconstructed. And when they are reconfigured and reconstructed, genetic mutation happens in the in the micro or rather in the quantum dimension of, in the quantum dimension of the DNA, there is genetic mutation. And when there is that particular genetic mutation, and there are certain particular propensities that have been generated with the potencies therein, and these particular potencies within the propensities are for actually generating realities. They are for generating realities. So the moment that uh, the moment that this spirit has come in and having come in through an agreement with the thought, there is that reconstitution of our cognitive structure. And these cognitive structures, if they are not dealt with, if they are not deconstructed and, and uh, if they are not deconstructed and constructed in the person of God, in the person of Christ, the reason why the Bible tells us do not be conformed to the systems of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you can prove that which is the good, perfect and acceptable will of God. When he's talking about do not be conformed to the systems of this world, he's talking about certain particular patterns, uh, certain particular thought patterns which have to do with certain particular cognitive structures structures. So he's telling us to not conform to the cognitive structures of the world. Do not conform to that, which also in the deeper sense, God is also telling us, don't let the enemy, don't let the enemy reconstruct and construct uh, your microcosmic uh, soul realities. Don't let him have access into the bowels of your soul. Don't let him have access into your propensities and deactivate certain propensities and generate certain other particular propensities. Because when he's making that particular statement, God is not just looking at us, but God is also looking at the generations that will proceed from us. Because at the end of the day, what we have to, uh, what we have to perceive is the following, that cognitive structures Cognitive structures are transmigrated through conception. Cognitive structures are transmigrated through conception. So in terms of attacking our in terms of attacking our in terms of attacking our minds, when the enemy is attacking our minds, he's not only aiming at us, but he's also aiming at our generations. Because at the end of the day, he wants to deconstruct and reconstruct our cognitive structures so that these particular cognitive structures that he develops that are in his image and in his likeness will be transmigrated to the generations that we uh, that we actually give birth to uh, through uh, now through conception because during conception there is a transmigration of of soul realities and cognitive structures uh, from both parents which form the cognitive structure of the parent so you, uh, of the child so you find that the cognitive structure of each and every single child is something that is uh, inherited but at the same time it is also something that can be reconstructed and deconstructed because when you come to when you come and you talk about uh, cognitive structures which have to do with the mind the mind of man is actually very very, it's malleable. Our minds are malleable because we are becoming beings and we exist within the law of becoming and we operate from, in, through and by this particular law of becoming from which you are constructed in, in the mind of God, through the mind of God, by the person of God, in eternity past, in a moment in eternity past. We are constructed in that particular law. We exist in that particular law. We function by that law. We function from that law and we actualize realities from that particular law and we construct as we have become and we also give birth we also give birth to what we have become we give back to what we have become so co consequent uh, so you find that consequently what happens is the following that in terms of birth in a child we birth a child the child that we birth the child that we birth, this particular child will carry a reverberation of our cognitive structures our cognitive structures will actually be transmigrated to them will be transmigrated to them. So Saturn understands this. And this is the reason why we have a lot of cognitive structure. Uh, we have a lot of cognitive wars. And when you have a lot of cognitive wars, it is also because Satan does not want us to fulfill our destinies. And he understands that our destiny a destiny is a reality to be constructed. A destiny is a reality to be constructed. A destiny is a reality to be constructed. And because he understands that, 
the moment he has access into our minds through the agreement with certain particular thoughts, what happens is the following, that now he begins to attack our destiny from within. Because the enemy attacks from without to have access within so that he can attack from within. He attacks from without to have access within so that he can attack from within. Now, what that tells us is the following, because now we have to also know that in terms of our time, in terms of our time, we exist within time, and time itself has a structure, and uh, within the structure of time is each and every single individual's time structure, that we have our own specific time structures, and we have an intended time structure, and we have a probable time structure, and we have a foreign time structure. So these particular time structures, you find that God highlights the structure of human existence and the structure and the common structure of uh, of the time structures of man in the book or in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 God highlights all of them there and one of the things you need to know is the following that God has set and appointed certain particular times and these certain particular times that God has appointed they have been appointed for certain particular realities ordained by, ordained by God to be actualized within time in time in a certain particular season and in a certain time within the season. God has appointed that. So the moment the enemy has access into our cognitive structures, he's able to actually cause us to exist within, he's able to cause us to exist within a probable reality, in a probable time structure, which eventually when it has aggrandized, it turns into a foreign time structure. And the moment it turns into a foreign time structure or a probable time structure, we lose time. We lose time. That's what the Bible says that uh, God will restore the ears that the locust has eaten. Because when the enemy causes us to exist within a probable time structure or a foreign time structure, there are ears that the enemy steals from us. And that's why the Bible says God restores the ears that the locust has eaten. He restores, he causes us to exist within the original time structure that he has appointed for us. That's why the enemy has us uh, facing a lot of cognitive battles uh, and attacks us cognitively speaking. Because he knows if he can have access to the soul and it is from the soul that we will if he can have access to the soul and cause us to will as he desires us to will, then we'll exist, with, we'll, we'll exist in a probable reality within a probable time structure that will eventually aggrandize and turn into a foreign time structure. And the moment it turns into a foreign time structure, it will, it will need a lot of it will need a lot of work in terms of prayers and so forth but we thank god because there's nothing that god cannot do including redeeming the times but we are also taught to redeem the times to redeem the times because the times that we exist in are evil which means the following to make most of time but to also redeem our own ears and to redeem our own times so that is what has to do with cognitive battles that the enemy will have us face a lot of, uh, we will have, a, have us face a lot of cognitive battles because he wants to reconstruct our cognitive structures. And the moment he reconstructs our cognitive structures, he's also aiming at our generations. He's also aiming at our generations. So this is part one. We'll get to do part two next week. Uh, we'll probably next week or the week before, but probably next week um, ahead of Christmas, we'll also talk about the virgin birth and understanding the virgin birth, uh, which is a chapter from a book within the reality series that is titled Eternity that has to do with understanding the person of God. That has to do with understanding the person of God. And if you are interested to learn more about the things that I've talked about, all of them are contained uh, in the books within the reality series. The reality series so far has um, eight published books. One of those books is a poem book, but the rest of them, they are books with different titles and different uh, other deal with deal with different topics that pertain to reality and that pertain to human existence. And I would really uh, recommend uh, book five and book six, book five and book six, because uh, they really talk a lot about uh, reality in terms of reality and probability as it relates to the mind. And they also talk about um, the framework of human existence and certain cosmic laws that govern our existences. For instance, when we agree with a negative thought, we end up attracting a negative entity. That has to do with the law of homogeneity uh, or the law of agreement that we attract that which we agree with and that is a universal law uh, and also uh, that actually every book is significant and important because in every book I refer to certain other particular books within the uh, within the reality series that enable us to actually understand reality uh, better and to grasp uh, certain realities within the alpha dimension of God because the focus of 
the reality series is the alpha dimension of God. The focus of the reality series is the alpha dimension of God. So make sure you check out um, uh, links that I'll be sharing on my page. Uh, just check them out. You can also check them out on my page, uh, Integrated Reads ILM. You can also check it out on my personal account, Kahua Gatoto. There are a lot of links I've put there uh, to purchase the books. And also you can follow me at Amazon, Joseph Kahua Gatoto, and my YouTube channel, Kahua Gatoto. You can subscribe for more teachings. And if you have a question, you can just ask. And uh, as God enables me, I'll be, also, I'll be able to answer that particular question. So God bless you so much. Thank you for tuning in. And I just want to pray with you right now. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We bless your name, Abba Father. We give you glory in Jesus' name. We pray that Almighty God, you will enable us to develop mental fortitude. That we will not give in so easily to the attacks of the enemy. That we will have mental fortitude and resist the enemy. That will give us discernment, Almighty Father, in the name of Jesus. So that we can actually discern and know Jehovah God, even when the enemy is projecting thoughts through people. And Father, we ask for forgiveness where we have conformed to people's expectation of us and we have not fulfilled the destiny you have called us to. We pray that you forgive us and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord. We magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you noticed, I haven't really talked much about music because uh, I deal with that particular topic in book uh, in book seven of the reality series, which is titled Reality and Music, and I'm giving away uh, free copies, but it's PDF. So if you're interested in reading the book, uh, just uh, in also getting the book, just drop me a, a, an inbox. Just tell me, hey, I want to excuse me, hey, I want to learn more about music. I want to learn more about um, thought projections as it relates to music and entertainment. And I'll just forward it to you and you can get to read it. And also all of the books within the reality series so far, uh, they are available. They are available, to, uh, they are available at Amazon and some are also available at uh, a Book dispos Dispository. Actually, all of them are, are available at Book Dispository. Some of them are available at uh, Barnes & Noble and others are available at... Um, if I remember the name, yes, at smashword.com. So you can check them out and also thank you so much. May God bless you. And remember to just subscribe to uh, the YouTube channel. Give me a like, comment, and also remember to share. If the teaching is a blessing to you, just share it. If there's something you want me to expound on and I've mentioned it, uh, just ask. And I'll, as God enables me, I'll give you feedback. May God bless you so much. Have a tremendous and amazing night.